The practice of magic is full of frustration and disappointment, but the study is a continual delight. Gilbert Norrell. Hello lovelies. I opened this video with one of my all-time favourite quotes from a fictional source on magic, and that's Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. It's a book and also a TV miniseries. If you haven't seen them or read it, definitely check them out because they are awesome and a really great, um, you know, exploration of the ideas of magic as a profession and magic as something that should be respected in society. So it really resonated with me, what with being a professional magician. In my magic practice, though, I have no qualms with using sources that are fictional rather than what we might consider academic. And so to open with a quote on magic from a fictional source, I feel is, is really relevant to what I'm going to get at here. As you can see from the title, I'm going to be talking about words, gestures, and components. These are an idea that was put forward to me when I was very young, and I had a copy of what was called a starter kit for wizards. This was a cute little booklet that came in like a little box pack and it had a hat and a cape with silver stars on them. And if someone had told me about the Agentum Astrum, I probably would have died then, but I digress. So I had this little book that sort of gives you all the information that you're gonna need as an apprentice wizard going off to your first year in, you know, wizard school. And there was a chapter in that book that spoke about spellcrafting. And I remember being really young and it really resonating with me and thinking, oh my gosh, this is, you know, revolutionary. And they were talking about words, gestures, and components as the three things that are required to do magic or to perform a spell. It was only a few years ago, while I was uh, getting into Dungeons and Dragons, the role-playing game, that I realized where these ideas were actually sourced from. And of course, the, um, the rules of magic within Dungeons and Dragons requires either a verbal, somatic, or material, uh, you know, component of that spell. Like I say, this is something that stuck with me from a very early age reading it in this book, and now that I'm a little bit older, a little bit wiser, I can sort of implement those ideas in my spellcrafting, and that's what I wanted to share with you guys today. I've read quite a few books on spells, or with spells in them, books of spells, and the the spells that are most beautiful to me, the ones that seem to work the best for me, are always the ones that incorporate these three things in a nice, even flowing way. Now this this process of spellcasting may be more geared toward the uh, energetic model, but I think you could still apply these same principles across the board, regardless of your paradigm of belief. So when I found these in this D&D handbook, I went ahead and really looked into them, and I assigned each of them one of the three alchemical primes, so sulfur, salt, and mercury. Mercury, of course, is the mind, so that would be any sort of verbal components. You've got the sulfur, which is the somatic, the movement, the gestural, and then you've got the salt, which is the physical and the material components that are used in the spell. Now, before I go ahead and break down each of these three terms, I do want to talk about some other aspects of spellcrafting that I think are really important. Um, so I just want to throw those out there before we get into those. So once you've got your intention worked out and you know what kind of spell you're wanting to cast, the first thing you should look at is auspicious timing. Try to have a look at, you know, planetary days and hours, uh, any planetary retrogrades, you might like to look at the moon phase or the season, whatever sort of um, things make timing most auspicious in your paradigm of belief and work within that so that you can get the fullest, um, you know, fullest boost from the time that you cast your spell as well. This use of timing is part of what I would consider to be saturation. So this is ultimately the goal that you're trying to achieve when putting together your spell. When a magician casts a circle, they're creating a little universe where, where they're like God. And by making sure that you saturate everything in that circle with a particular energy or a particular vibration, um, what you're going to achieve is, again, a boost in the qualities that you're looking for so that you can manifest that in the outer world once you leave the circle. Now, of course, each of these principles for spellcasting can be used alone or, or mingled together in a nice way. I find that the spells that engage me the most are the ones that bring these three things into harmony and execute them, you know, in a beautiful way. 
The first of these that we're going to look at is the verbal aspects, so the words that we use. These can be rhyming chants, they can be songs, they could be prayers or orations, they can be an address to a deity, all of these sorts of things. I would say as well that they can be as simple as trigger words. So a single phrase, a single word, um, something like, so mote it be, which is pretty common, um, to, to execute the finality of the spell. The second thing, of course, would be the gestures, the movements. I think in sort of the Eastern systems, these might look something like mudras, but I mean, the Western um, esoteric system definitely has a unique set of salutes and movements that they have as well. Now, just like with our verbal components, these could be the trigger. Something as simple as, you know, the sign of benediction or something like that could be the activation sign for the spell, the trigger sign for the spell. Spells that use only components is probably going to be the most common one to people. These are going to be things like tinctures and potions or even talismans or amulets that have symbols inscribed on them. Um, you know, they become a physical manifestation. I would also say that in a, uh, a fully formed spell using all three of these components, this would be, you know, a tag lock or a personal curio, a personal fetish for a person if you're trying to cast a spell upon another person. So in my opinion, I definitely think that a well-crafted spell should bring all of those three things into unity in a really beautiful way, using language and gestures and components that are resonant to the spell's intention. Of course, this is just my interpretation based on a fictional source that I enjoyed and the magical system that they implemented in that. I think it's a really fun way to sort of pick apart a spell to sort of see how the gears in it move. There are other things, of course, that I think are important in spell casting, things like restrictions and things like that. Um, you know, so this isn't by any means a definitive approach to spellcasting, but I think it's really nice principles to make sure that you're incorporating whenever you're trying to put a spell together and find those working pieces. And in saying that, I'd love to hear what you guys think is the most important principles in spellcasting. Go ahead and leave them in the comments below. As always, I hope you found this video informative or at the very least entertaining, and I hope you're well. Mwah.